I'm Chris Alvarez, and welcome to Military History Inside Out, brought to you by War Scholar. We're located on the web at warscholar.org and militaryhistorypodcast.com. Thank you. I'm speaking with Dr. Vladimir Solinari, author of A Satellite Empire, Romanian Rule in Southwestern Ukraine, 1941 to 1944. Thank you for speaking with me. Thank you for having me. So first, uh, how did you get into writing a book like this and studying the subject? Oh, okay. Uh, so basically, I'm from the area. So I am interested about this subject by just by virtue of knowing the place, hearing the stories about this time, having family who had some things to tell me from different perspectives. Uh, but I also the author of a book on the policy of ethnic cleansing in Romania during World War II. And so, in a sense, I conceived this book as a sequel to the first one. Mm -hmm. It took me more time than I expected to write it, and I'm still writing something which would be sequel to this one. Mm -hmm. But this is a story about um, the um, one country administering population who spoke a different language whose leaders, Romanian leaders, conceived this occupation as a benevolent one but which ended up actually in them alienating the local population. And this is a part of World War II but it's also part of this great human tragedy when um, people have sometimes good intentions, but believe that they can force those good intentions on other people, and in fact ending up causing um, sufferings and um, a lot of victims along the road. Mm -hmm. So this is part of the same uh, very tragic story of the 20th century, which is relatively little known, and I wanted to make it better known than the basic basis of the newly available evidence. Mm -hmm. So roughly, what's the um, the area, the size of this region that we're talking about? Okay, that was an area between the, uh, the Nister River. Nister is D-N-I-E-S-T-E-R, and Southern Buch Rivers. And um, it is roughly between today's Republic of Moldova and, um, well, the Buch River, but the most important center there is Odessa. It's mm -hmm. a port city, it's a big city, in fact, it was a metropolis at the time. Uh, and the Russian Empire, at one time, it was the, sec the third most important city after uh, St. Petersburg in Moscow. Mm -hmm. uh, then it, its importance declined, but it still remained an important port city, cosmopolitan, uh, with the um, very rich cultural life, was the renowned university, which declined during the 20 years of Soviet mismanagement between the wars, but still remained an important city. And so um, this was the territory that um, Hitler gave to Romania mm -hmm. uh, as a compensation for their war efforts. Mm -hmm. They said, take as much territory in these you, they, as you want, but Romanians felt that they could not administer bigger territory, so they agreed, in fact, in fact, uh, on this smaller piece. But it still was a territory of a little less than two million, two and a half million people. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so for Romanians, it was an experience they didn't expect, they'd never had before. But they wanted to both show themselves as the um, European nation who could protect the local population, bring civilization back to the benighted locals who were brutalized by the Soviets. But at the same time, they wanted to exploit it economically to support their war efforts. And of course, it, those um, objectives were in contradiction with each other from the very beginning. So eventually, the idea is we need to get as much from this region as possible at any cost to the local population because we are waging this holy war against uh, Soviet communism. 
overwhelmed on other considerations. Mm -hmm. And so, in fact, by their brutal policy of extraction of anything of value that they could found in the region, by the end of their short rule there, they alienated most of the population, which initially, in fact, uh, embraced them as the liberators from, from the Soviet-type communism. Mm -hmm. That is, in a nutshell, the story that I am telling there. But, of course, it had many other aspects to it, too, some of which I actually was not able to cover, and I expect to cover in the next project. So what was the, had Germany won the war, what was the idea as, as to how this, would this territory have become part of Romania? Would it be, become an independent nation? What was the plan? No, no, no. It, Germans wanted Romanians to annex this territory. Hmm. But this um, desire of Germany was not altruistic at all. Hmm. Uh, there was um, a subtext to it that Romanians became aware of. In fact, in the year 1940, uh, Romanians had to cede a part of their national territory of Transylvania, which for them had a tremendous value to Hungary. It mm -hmm. was done under the Germany's uh, pressure. Mm -hmm. So, for Romanian government, priority number one was to get Transylvania back from Hungary. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want to annex any other territory before they solve this issue of Transylvania because then the Germans and Hungarians could claim, look, you have been confiscated or uh, compensated already for uh, the loss of Transylvania by this annexation of trans trans the territory of Ukraine called Transnistria. We are not giving you Transylvania back. So as long as the Transylvanian issues was not solved, Romanians would not declare annexation. Mm -hmm. But ideally, they surely wanted to annex it mm -hmm. after the end of hostilities, depending on how the war would turn out. Mm -hmm. And again, their plans were, <laughs> in this sense, um, if they would be fully implemented, they wanted to, in fact, cleanse the territory from all non-Romanians there. So, again, that was another aim of theirs, which was in the longer run, and they actually didn't come even close to starting to implement it. Mm -hmm. But had they been given the full freedom, they would have expelled all ethnic non-Romanians and populated with Romanians only. Mm -hmm. uh, so it all depended on how the war would conduct. Mm -hmm. so but I'd... because they lost the war, nothing of this actually mattered. Mm -hmm. So how did the progress of Operation Barbarossa affect um, how they administered this area as, as time went on? Yeah, uh, see, when Romanians went into the war against Russians, they were actually even more optimistic as to the um, prospects of victory than the Germans. Hmm. While German, Germans were calculating that they would win the war, but they said, uh, say, um, mid-October, Romanians were telling them, no, six weeks will be, would be enough. Mm. And um, so they, they, they went into the war very optimistic, and they were so over-optimistic um, about themselves too that they actually asked Germans to let them, only them, on their own, to uh, take the port city of Odessa, mm -hmm. occupied. But the battle lasted, in fact, from August till uh, the 18th of October, mm -hmm. and in no way they were winning it. Mm -hmm. When Soviets finally abandoned Odessa, that was due to the German advance in Crimea, when the Soviets had to concentrate on forces on the defense of the Sevastopol, mm -hmm. and so they moved all the remaining troops from Odessa to Sevastopol. But in fact, Germans were oh, sorry, Romanians were losing the Battle of Odessa. There were three major offensive attacks on the city, all of which they lost. <laughs> mm -hmm. And not only were they losing those um, offensives, but in fact. Soviets mounted even a counter-offensive, which actually dislodged Romanians from all of their advances territory-wise, which they had in the previous weeks. 
So it was a disaster. Everybody understood that the Battle of Odessa was a disaster, and they taught Romanians the lessons that the war probably would be longer, <laughs> and it would be more difficult. And already by the end of 41, the war leader, uh, Ioan Antonescu, started to experience this kind of premonitions that it's not going to, to end well. But he had these changes of mood, and sometimes he would be in a pessimistic mood, and he would recover and pretend he was optimistic. Mm -hmm. So through the very bitter end of his rule over the country, on the um, till 23rd of August 1944, mm -hmm. he continued to insist that Romania should f fight side by side with the Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, and they contributed a lot, a lot, um, almost half a million men the fighting Romanian army at Stalingrad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was second most important contribution at this time mm -hmm. uh, after Italy. Uh, and of course, the defeat at Stalingrad was, was the second major disappointment. But I must tell that at Stalingrad, Romanians actually understood earlier than Germans mm -hmm. that the battle was likely to end up in disaster. Mm -hmm. Germans put them on the flanks and they were telling them that they didn't have either manpower or material to withstand the Soviet offensive that they knew was being prepared at the time. Mm -hmm. And already in August, they realized that the battle was probably was going to be lost. Mm -hmm. So... Um, yeah, uh, Romanian morale suffered a major blow already in the fall of 1941 mm -hmm. and was completely vanquished in 42. So how much of the Romanian military was needed to occupy this region while the rest were forward fighting? See, it's not only in this region. Um, they also participated in the anti-partisan warfare in Crimea, mm -hmm. in Kuban region, and they were put on the flanks in the Stalingrad. As far as I can tell this story, Germans needed them not so much as a fighting force, mm -hmm. as an auxiliary who would police the territories that they didn't have manpower to police. Mm -hmm. Okay. And of course, it was the stupidest of the idea of there at Stalingrad to put them exactly where they were the most vulnerable. Mm. But that was at the moment when Hitler himself lost already the touch with reality. I guess at that moment of the Battle of Stalingrad, he was so fixated on that that he ignored all the evidence mm -hmm. of uh, the weakening German strategic position there. But other than that, Romanians troops after the Battle of Odessa were not expected to mount major offensive on their own. Mm. They were usually um, mopping up operations in the rear, uh, fighting the partisan, the army of occupation. But one need to bear in mind need, uh, that Germans needed a lot of manpower to police those enormous territories. So whatever Romanians could offer them mm -hmm. was a valuable contribution. Initially, Hitler dismissed all of this. He was he actually, before the war started, he went on record telling his, gem, uh, his generals that no trust of our Romanian allies, they probably could defend their position, but only if in front of them was very deep and wide river. Mm. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's the only cap thing that they were capable of. But then he seemed to have changed his position when he realized that, for example, Crimea, uh, Crimea's occupation was a difficult thing because Soviets tried to retake it, and there was this catacombs, it's basically like quarries, mm. underground quarries that the partisans were hiding. Okay. This is a very dangerous, difficult time for them, for the Germans. These attacks and Romanians showed themselves, especially these elite divisions, with, which were known as um, mountain shooters, mm -hmm. and 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 they they valued their contribution. German, uh, Hitler made a point that German generals would cite them for bravery mm. in their orders to the German troops. Although there is uh, enormous evidence that 
generals did it, but German men, soldiers, didn't like the Romanian conquerors, and they despised them. Hmm. And Romanians knew that too. Interesting. So there was a lot of tension. So if the Romanians, if their major contribution was policing, how, um, how effectively did they do that? Well, I, I can't really say much about the rest of the territory. It's, I think it's a kind of a different conversation. As far as Romania, as far as Transnistria, this is the region of which I wrote, right? Right. It's concerned. Um, this is the story that I tell. Okay. Uh, see, Odessa was also sitting on this, um, on this, basically on a rock of the local local soft uh, uh, rock, which uh, was also queried for a long time, mm -hmm. for more than a century. And as a result, there was this labyrinth of queries, which they called catacombs, mm -hmm. going in different directions. And this was something that was used by all kinds of uh, criminals as a hiding places mm -hmm. since Tsarist time and then the Soviet time. And the Soviet authorities, before withdrawing from Odessa, created terrorist groups which they were supposed to hide in the catacombs, mm -hmm. have their spy networks in the city, mm -hmm. and then cause trouble to Romanians. And indeed, um, at the very end of 30, of 8th of, um, 30, 26th of October, mm -hmm. Basically, 10 days after the occupation of the city, which was 22nd, they blew up the headquarters, Romanian headquarters, killing generals, officers. Hmm. So that was their only major achievement, because then Romanians mounted a successful intelligence operation, apprehended the spies on the surface, and also, in a short while, destroyed all the remaining groups in the catacombs. So that success, despite these fast laws, was, was in fact, complete. Mm -hmm. right? They could not do much beyond this um, massive explosion. Mm -hmm. Um, Soviets later would create there was this great explorer, this partisan myth, partisan glory. They wrote books and created the museum, but it looks like ninety-five percent is was just pure mythology, yeah. right? Imagination mm -hmm. of the Soviet propagandists. So in this sense, Romanians were very successful, but their problem was their greed and the determination to pump as much resources from the country, mm -hmm. from this this region, as possible. Mm -hmm. And so they lie to people, promising that if you will sow and harvest, then we'll leave you one uh, half of what you harvest, take another. But they ended up systematically requisitioning everything, mm -hmm. <laughs> or practically everything, leaving people on the brink of starvation, or actually even sometimes starving in the countryside. So by the end of their rule, according to their own uh, intelligent gathering bodies, close to one half of the population hated them so intensely that they were just waiting for the Soviets' return. And remember, this was after the purges, mm -hmm. after the collectivization, after the famine. So the fact that Romanians achieved <laughs> such a tremendous change of the local population's attitude toward themselves in such a short period of time mm -hmm. seems to be uh, really astonishing. And it shows how inept they were. Because mm -hmm. ironically, I think they didn't need to pump it. In fact, they pumped so much they could not even stock it. <laughs> they couldn't properly guard it. Yeah. And the result, much of it was being spoiled. The yeah. cattle was arriving in a poor condition. Um, perhaps locals already was, were poisoning it, local population was poisoning the cows, the sheep that Romanians were taking away from them, mm -hmm. and spreading some kind of episodics, uh, you know, epidemics among, among, among the cattle. Mm -hmm. So 
these animals arrived in such a poor shape that they were not usable anymore mm -hmm. in Romania. And of course, against this background of dismantling the factories, dismantling the productive um, assets, in the country, moving even practically all food produced in the countryside, maybe not, of course, all, but mm -hmm. a bulk of what was produced there, um, turned the population against them. Um, not everybody, the Odessa intelligentsia, mm -hmm. like painters, writers, they hated Soviets so, so intensely that they still prefer Romanians. Mm -hmm. But the lower classes, like farmers mm -hmm. and workers, they turned decisively against Romanians. And the partisan movement, in fact, flared up. Mm -hmm. And it's surprising because the territory was not particularly forested. Mm -hmm. Only 6% of the territory were forests. So where would they hide? Mm -hmm. And nevertheless, there were really big partisan detachments at one point in time presented the serious problems from Romanians and even when Germans returned when they were retreating, eventually Romanians surrendered control of the territory to the Germans for a long, very short period of time from November to, to uh, so from January to uh, um, April 44. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the Germans also reported that they were facing a serious resistant groups who were attacking, cutting telephone, telegraph lines, attacking uh, railway stations. Mm -hmm. And one point in time, they actually engaged them in a serious battle. So the Germans had to, to send even two tanks and one or two Stukas mm -hmm. to fight those partisan detachments. It, it, it tells, it's, the story is amazing because as I said, initially, all reports were that the population was very positive towards the Romanians. They expected them to bring better life, better chances. By the end, it was just the opposite of it and most of, of uh, the territory. So let me ask about the ethnic cleansing that Romania did in its own country. Did it bring these people over and, right. and jail them there, or did they just bring them over and say, here, just, you're going to live That's here? That's very, very correct. In fact, by, when I was writing my first book, I decided to leave uh, Transnistria aside because Romanians' main concern was to cleanse Romania mm -hmm. from all minorities. And, of course, the first uh, targets were Jews, mm -hmm. right? But then um, there were also um, Roma and Ukrainians and Bulgarians and, and Hungarians too. So ideally, they wanted the country to be what they called homogenized mm. ethnically. Mm. And it involved not necessarily killing of people, but expelling them and exchanging them. Mm. So we give to Hungary, our, our Hungarians, so they give us their Romanians, and the same we do with Bulgaria and with all other countries. So by the end of the war, the country would be completely ethnically homogenous. They believed that this would be the future of all European states in, ca in case Germany would win the war. All countries would try to, be, to become ethnically homogenous, and what, that's what they tried to achieve. Hmm. But it so happened that although they didn't plan it, um, they brought a lot of Jews into Transnistria, mm -hmm. right? And um, put them in camps there. They expected them that the war would end by the following in 41, and then they would export them somewhere into the east. They didn't know where. Mm -hmm. They didn't expect them to stay in Transnistria. How the weather will continue, Germans didn't want to deal with these Jews uh, themselves. They wanted Romanians to take care of them. Hmm. And so they ended up not only bringing them people there, putting them in the camps and in the ghettos, and they were absolutely not ready. There were no resources to give them. And the typhus population spread among the inmates, and they didn't have any means to treat them or even to try and stop it. So they responded to by cordoning off 
the camps, mm -hmm. isolating the boys, letting them die, mm -hmm. and in some cases, cases in some places carrying out preventive executions. Right. So, so they basically in the camps, camp of Bogdanovka and a nearby camp of Duma, Dumanovka, they executed maybe fifty up to 70,000 people. Mm. It's one of the greatest massacres. The numbers are so high that it is hard to believe mm -hmm. that the evidence is there. Mm -hmm. These people were brought, um, they were dying, they didn't know what to do with them, and then Germans came, because it was on the border between Romania and the German zone of occupation. Mm -hmm. The Germans said, don't you see what's happening? These people are spreading typhus. We don't want to die together with them. Mm. You need to deal with this issue. Mm. And Romanians let themselves be persuaded, and eventually they organized the, this massive, multi, uh, several weeks operation of, of killing, mm -hmm. killings. And there were other massacres of this kind, other places, slightly different circumstances. Mm. So, Transnistria was transformed into the massive killing ground mm. yeah. of the Jews. Yeah. It's not necessarily that they wanted to kill all of them, but at one point in time they decided why should we support them? Yeah. They didn't kill all. Mm -hmm. In fact, the survival rate of Transnistria still remained much higher than it was in the nearby Reich uh, Commissariat to Ukraine which is the German-occupied Ukrainian territory. Okay. Much high, uh, higher, but it still mm -hmm. was a massive killing ground. Did the Romanians use specialized troops to do this killing, or did they just have the average soldier? That's a very good question. Exactly. They didn't have specialized troops. You probably mean something like SS, right? Right. No, and this was a big problem for them because the regime initially it was a, a kind of a hybrid regime, half military dictatorship, but in alliance with the fascist party known as Iron Guard. Mm -hmm. But this alliance didn't last, because eventually Antonescu, this military dictatorship, general and then marshal, he put himself a marshal, mm -hmm. um, he could not tolerate divided control of the country yeah, okay. and he despised those guys as dangerous dilettantes and fanatics mm -hmm. interesting and in fact he persuaded Hitler that this was the case Hitler perceived them as he and he made his comparison explicitly mm -hmm. in his conversation with with, with was was um, uh, uh, Antonescu? He compared this Iron Guard uh, to the SA, mm -hmm. which he eliminated the leadership. He eliminated the, the uh, Knight of Long uh, um, Knives, mm -hmm. and, and basically said, "Okay, step. You need to deal with them as I deal with my own fanatics." Mm -hmm. So, giving him a license to kill, mm -hmm. and eventually. It was not he who started the confrontation, uh, but um, the Iron Guard, but the armies uh, still supported their own General Antonescu, and he suppressed the uprising. And from that moment on, he suppressed all political parties, all paramilitary organizations. Mm -hmm. It was, in fact, a military dictatorship which operated with the support of the bureaucracy, police, gendarmerie, and the army. Mm -hmm. All of this illegal entities, nothing like SS or SA. Um, they were not ideological fanatics, they were just regular bureaucrats and army officers. Mm -hmm. And so to organize massive killings operations presented some kind of difficulty mm -hmm. in, in, under these conditions. And they had to find solutions ad hoc under different conditions. Mm -hmm. Because not all army officers were ready to do that. Uh, some didn't like the idea of engaging this kind of barbarity. Others believed it would ruin the discipline. Mm. And um, others w 
were, were ready to participate in the massacres. But there was contradictory, there were contradictory views of that. And eventually in Transnistria, um, most massacres were conducted by either the um, local police, which were recruited from the local population, but this recruitment quite often was under duress. Yeah, okay. Right? Or by the ethnic German militia, because there were ethnic German villages, yeah. and then this ethnic German would be organized as a military, it says, it says, come up, that's called um, Zonderkommando Air, uh, SS on the commander who, who had the, the task to organize these villages. Okay. And they created this ethnic German militia of Weltschutz, mm -hmm. uh, self protection, right? And, and they carried out this um, act, um, murders, mass murder. Mm -hmm. And in Odessa, where about 20,000 Jews were murdered as a reprisal against this. Uh, explosion by the Soviet mm. right, mm. of the wrong. Those executions were, were carried out by the volunteers from the army. Okay. So, see, they had to find a way how to go around it because, strictly speaking, it was all illegal. Orders which were issued to shoot and to kill mm -hmm. were illegal orders. People knew it. And sometimes they insisted that they would receive a written order because they wanted to cover themselves. Huh. Okay. Romanian law, in fact, both the criminal code or penal code, right, and the um, code of military justice required that the subordinates uh, refuse to implement illegal order. Otherwise, it would be held responsible. Okay. There was such provision. Hmm. And some people agreed to carry out, maybe without actually understanding this legal niceties, but others were aware. Mm -hmm. And they would say, no, no, do whatever we want, but I'm not participating in it. And so they had to maneuver and hide ways how to kill these people um, without actually implicating themselves, the bosses didn't want to implicate them, they didn't want to leave paper trails hmm. and to find volunteers. So it's a really, really uh, a complicated story. I, I published on this already a um, couple of articles and, and, I, and, I, and I will, the book that I'm writing, I, I want to write about this more. So. Mm -hmm. Before I turn, I'm going to turn to uh, the research you did, uh, the resources you used. Are there any other major points in the book that we haven't talked about that you might want to uh, mention? Okay, let me think a little bit. Um, yeah, the title. Mm -hmm. the title what, what does the title suggest? What does the satellite empire? Mm -hmm. What I wanted to convey the, by this title is the idea that see, it's Romanians wanted to impress on the Germans, but potentially on other Europeans too, that they were a big and important country. Mm -hmm. And in their view, that implied the ability to annex the territories and to rule them in a way like other European countries would do. In their imagination, territories to the east of Romania were these oriental territories, almost like, like Europeans imagined oriental territories in Asia, oh. in Africa. Mm -hmm. So they were simultaneously bringing civilization there and also trying to reach themselves on their account. Mm -hmm. This is the logical European colonialism, and they tried to, tried to follow these footsteps. There is evidence that they conscientiously try to study these practices and to imply um, this kind of rhetoric in Transnistria. But at the same time, they were in some sort of position vis-a-vis -vis Germany. Right. And Germans never allowed full 100% of Romanians. They said it's full, but they still wanted part of the 
uh, plunder from uh, Transnistrian resources. They never allowed complete control of communications of ports. They always were wrangling how much Romanian troops could requisition and how much German troops who were going and passing through them. And Romanians never completely achieved full control of the territory. They supposedly Hitler gave Antonescu uh, to do whatever he wanted with this. And so this subordinate position of Romania vis-a-vis -vis Germany um, went hand in hand with the ambition of becoming a kind of a empire in Eastern Europe. Right. And that particularly um, almost, I would say, ironic situation I, I also wanted to explore because this is how the ambitions and the imaginations are kind of was the constantly encountering the resistance of reality on the ground. The balance of material forces was such that they were not as important that they tried to present themselves. Mm -hmm. that, that idea of colonizing Soviet territory as though it were... Yes. Like, you know, just like other territories is... I've never heard that before, and it's pretty fascinating to think about. Yeah, and, and you know, there was... Not, no, no, it, it, Germans also thought of this this way, because mm -hmm. there is... There are books about it that they, you know, Germans' perception of Eastern Europe, it was, uh, especially those populated by, by Slav, it's almost like an empty space mm -hmm. that they need to come and organize mm -hmm. in the German way to bring order in civilization. Mm -hmm. And this is a long lasting means in German psyche mm -hmm. that all civilization in the east of Europe existed due to their civilizing influence, they mm. call right? And um, Romanians kind of also followed in the footsteps of this imagination. Mm. But when they came to Odessa, and this is also something that I explored, they came to Odessa, what they found there was the culture of such a high level of sophistication, mm. for example, the, uh, opera theater of a very high quality, ballet. Antonescu himself was lecturing his ministers that the Odessa opera is incomparably better than anything they had. And so see, how is that that they bring bringing civilization to the people who... Uh, this was also not the reality which they needed to cope, and that was also kind of culture shock to, to them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So... Um, what resources did he use for your research? What uh, archives and, and papers and that sort of thing? Well, thanks God, um, we have now a lot uh, since the end of communism. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked in the archives of Romania, uh, Moldova, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But I also worked in the archives in the uh, U.S. Holocaust Museum, which actually has copies, microfilm copies, mm -hmm. from all European countries. It's mostly about Jews, but of course they cover other areas too, because they didn't um, copy pages, they copied whole files. And mm -hmm. files, by definition, they contain much more information than uh, just in one aspect. And also in Yad Vashem, in Jerusalem, this is the museum and national shrine of the, of, of the Shoah, how they call it. So, uh, in fact, it's also from um, from um, from Russia the, the the documents, but and also other documents. Though I didn't work there, but I knew what I wanted to see from Germany, and so they have this service you can order, and they will copy it and send it to you. Mm -hmm. So those were the materials that that I used, and they had, but of course there were a lot also publications like memoirs on the Romanian side, of the Russian side. If you're interested in the memoirs of the Russian side, let me tell you an anecdote. That's a really interesting story. Maybe some of the listeners might like it and viewers might like it. And this is the story of an um, aspiring composer in Odessa uh, who was a young, Mike, young man in his early 20s. He was left by the Soviets of Odessa, was not mobilized in the Red Army because Soviet policy would be, before they withdrew, they would mobilize in the Red Army all men. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So they would not leave them for, for the enemy. Mm. But this man was left there because he had some kind of physical uh, condition that he didn't explore in his diary. He, he kept a very, very um, detailed diary. Mm. And uh, so he lived, his father supported him. His father was a director of a um, liquor factory. Mm -hmm. And so he was well placed under the Soviets and under the Romanians. He could support him. He didn't experience in material hardships. And he continued his musical education. This is the war, people died, but the conservatory is there. He continues his education. Now, on top of it all, he was gay. Mm -hmm. But of course, he never disclosed it. Mm -hmm. And he loved one young guy from Odessa who went with the, Rush, with the Red Army. Ah, okay. So all these wartime years, he pines for him. Mm. He writes about him, how he remembers, and he dreams at night about him. It's his obsession. The, Women liked him. They, they could not figure out what was going on with this guy. Mm -hmm. And so they, they, they pursued him, but he didn't respond. Now, what's interesting, that probably due to this fact that his love wasn't the Red Army, he developed an identity of a Soviet patriot. But all this creative intelligence of Odessa, musicians, composers, poets, who stay there under Romanians, they were decidedly anti-Soviet. Mm -hmm. And so he mingles with them, hides his identity both as, the, as a gay man mm -hmm. and as a Soviet patriot, mm -hmm. patriot and, and writes this, this is, excruciating details about their conversations, about how they behaved, how he cringed before the Romanians and how he hated their behavior. And this is incredibly rich a rich um, uh, source, which recently he wrote all of this, and the, the, the diary was found by his his friend after his death, and then he published it. Mm -hmm. But there is nothing comparable in the richness of the detail from within, mm -hmm. which comes even close. We come even close to this this document, yeah. and of course, it's incredibly interesting to observe how he. There is some kind of um, superficiality in his this Sovietness. You feel that he's not really Soviet, but he adopted this identity because he identifies with the Red Army in which he's, oh. you know, lower side. It, it, it's unbelievably complicated and very, very fine story. Was he able to exchange letters with the, the man he loved? Not during the war. I don't know what happened after the war. But, um, I know that he lived as a private person. You know, he taught music. Mm -hmm. He didn't achieve much of a fame, no nothing. But you might know this name, Svetoslav Richter. It's a great composer. Mm -hmm. Sorry, oh, not composer. Uh, um, pianist. Okay. Player. Mm -hmm. One of... You can check later on. It's, it's one of the great names. Now, he was from Odessa. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, and this is typical Soviet story. He's, he, he was half German, half Russian, mm -hmm. ethnically. His mother was Russian and his father was German. Now, at the time of the war, he was in Moscow. He was already a famed performer. Mm -hmm. He performed on Radio Moscow, it was transmitted, but his father was executed by the Soviets mm -hmm. just before they surrendered because he was arrested on charges of being a German spy and ex executed. Yeah. And his mom listening on the radio how her son performs in Moscow yeah. knows something the son doesn't know. Right. His father is no more. Oh, wow. How would you know they saw all that? Yeah. You know. That's uh, <laughs> it's yeah. it's just it's just unbelievable. It's a real Soviet story. Those are real Soviet stories. Yeah, yeah. Did you come yeah. across it, were you able to travel to the region to for oh, yeah, research? of course, of course. How else would I work in those archives? Yeah, I spent a lot of time there. Mm -hmm. A lot of time. Mostly during the summers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did you come across any um 
uh, physical artifacts or objects that related at all to your research? Oh, they have, um, they have um, now museums on the defense of Odessa, on this and that. Those were Soviet era, and I don't believe, I don't know how authentic those documents are, you know. Yeah. When I actually was um, to the museum in Odessa, uh, historical museum, and talked to the, um, uh, to the uh, employees there, I realized that their criteria of truthfulness uh, do not meet my standard. Mm -hmm. And so I am very um, pessimistic. Soviets, uh, Soviets were very determined to destroy all evidence which was independent, not controlled by them. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they produced a lot of photographs, mm -hmm. but those were staged mostly. Mm -hmm. And how you treat staged photographs, yeah. some, some of the photographs of course survived. Oh, I can tell you this is an interesting story. Mm -hmm. um, when the book was already accepted for publication, I decided I wanted to put some photos there. Mm -hmm. Photos, many photos from this period are available online, but you cannot testify to the authenticity and you don't have the copyright, so you can publish them. Mm -hmm. So I was determined to find them in different archival collections and museums. And a couple of, um, of such I found in the military museum in Bucharest. Mm -hmm. in the last moment, they refused to grant me permission to publish them because they were judging from the title from my book, it doesn't um, fit into the framework of Romanian historiography. Uh, I see. <laughs> like, said, like, and this is military museum in Bucharest, the museum of the army. And the photos were in fact produced by the army department of propaganda. Mm -hmm. But they said nothing, we don't want. We will not give to you anything because we don't like you. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> and this is a this is a country that's a member of NATO. Yeah. You know, supposedly democratic and a friend of America and everything. Interesting. Here we go. Bad habits die hard. Yeah. So as far as the travel question, I was curious if you had uh, gone to the lab, these labyrinths you mentioned, and the uh, any of the yeah. camps, if any of them exist still, or yes, okay. uh, the, there is a museum of it's called Partisan Glory, mm -hmm. and the village of Nerobaiska, it's very close to Odessa. You can actually go there by by taking a regular bus, mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah, it's actually in the catacombs, and uh, and they show you um, um, different um, branches of it. But the problem with the catacombs was that, see, the queries were done in such a disorderly manner that seemingly nobody ever had exact map yeah. of of those. Um, passages. Mm -hmm. And so what they show us today tourists, right? Mm -hmm. And how it was in reality, I, I, I guess it's nobody can tell. Right. Um, the last survivors might be still alive. Very young man recently gave an interview. It was posted on the YouTube. Mm -hmm. I listened to it and judging from how he told his story, it was an unmitigated disaster. Of course, I always felt this way. This whole catacomb partisan detachments, mm -hmm. they, um, it was a disaster because the, it was easy to find them. Mm -hmm. You didn't need to actually descend in the catacombs and find them. It was enough to close the entrances. Yeah. And it also would close the, the entry for oxygen. Right. And so these people would get asphyxiated. Mm -hmm. So it was only so much time they can survive in the catacombs. Mm -hmm. Besides, there was a problem of provisioning. Mm -hmm. So, and besides the psychological pressure of being trapped mm -hmm. in the, this stony, you know, rock, 
in this rock, right, without any entrance. And the terror of the NKVD officers, which were put in charge of those detachments. Mm -hmm. So the suspicion develops, who is a spy, who is not a spy. Mm -hmm. In several groups, the groups collapsed under this pressure of internal internal divisions. Mm -hmm. They started killing each other. Oh. And there was even cannibalism. Oh, wow. Yes. And then Romanians exploited it. So it looks like nobody of them survived, maybe for, for this exception of this one or two young guys or somehow. Mm -hmm. But the leaders certainly did not. Some were apprehended by Romanians, others were killed by their own, some <laughs> others were even eaten. Wow. And those were and those were the secret the Soviets kept. They told the story of one NKVD officer who was in fact apprehended, tried and and, and executed by the Romanians, mm -hmm. but they didn't tell the story of others. And um, so they still have this museum of partisan glory, but what glory was this? It mm -hmm. was a tragedy. Yeah. It was a poorly conceived operation. It was a great waste of, of man, of resources. It's very little, um, very little um, gain for the Soviets. See, the big problem for these people was that the population didn't like them. Mm -hmm. And who was this spies of theirs whom they left in the city? Mm -hmm. the local, they were the same NKVD agents that the locals knew who they were from the Soviet time. Mm -hmm. And of course, they were almost too, um, too ready to turn them over to the Romanians. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the destruction of this group was so quick and efficient exactly because population participated in their apprehension, in the destruction of this network. Mm -hmm. To the extent that the partisan movement reappeared in the 43, it's because the population attitude changed. Right, yeah. <laughs> and see? Yeah. And, but that was something that, of course, nobody knew. This dynamic was something nobody knew from the beginning. and. And this is the, something that I explored at some length, um, kind of providing this revisionist narrative mm -hmm. as a counterpoint to the still dominant Soviet one. Mm -hmm. Of course, Romanians knew it all the way. And see, what I tried to achieve in my book, this is um, systematic use of both Russian language and Romanian language, and some German language too, mm -hmm. because historians who still write about it, the Ukrainians, they still work mostly with the Soviet era documents mm -hmm. and the memoirs of whoever people live there, right? Mm -hmm. Written in, in Russian or Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. But Romanians work with the <laughs> Romanian historians work with their documents, and they almost do not speak to each other, right? Mm -hmm. While I, having this benefit of, of reading in two languages, um, more than that, but two most important for this research, I was able to uh, compare and try to figure out what was correct and what version was closer to reality and more, um, more um, trustworthy mm -hmm. than and whose was not. And uh, in this sense, I, I believe that this, is, this book is a kind of transnational in its character. I try to transcend borders and I don't take sides of any of those be, um, belligerents. What interests me most is the people's behavior caught in this vortex incredible of, of World War II, mm -hmm. the destruction. What, what part of the research has been most enjoyable for you? Oh, gosh. Nothing of this is really enjoyable, but I must say is that and there is some kind of emotional attachment to it. Once you start reading it, you never have enough because the stories are so dramatic. Mm -hmm. And um, the obvious kind of stupidity and evil in human nature um because becomes so 
powerfully present mm -hmm. in what you read. It almost like teaches you the most important lessons about who we humans really are. Mm -hmm. And we start doing it. I think it's like studying the Holocaust, right? Much of it is part of the Holocaust, what, what I did. Mm -hmm. Not in this book, but generally in what, what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, I think, why would I even be interested in any of this? Holocaust is the most horrible subject you want. And I am telling myself, no, no, that's enough. I will move. But then I realize I can't move away from it. It somehow goes and haunts me. <laughs> Stalinist repression with the Holocaust, those are the things which probably are the most important for in the 20th century, and you can't leave them behind once you start start researching them. It, it, you, you almost become a slave of, of this material. And it's, it, it's, it's hard, but it's also somehow you feel it's the most important thing in life that you can do and you you need to do because it's almost like your mission to tell those stories yeah yeah which that. otherwise won't be but, and and would you may misunderstood and misrepresented misremembered maybe i want to recover them mm -hmm. help the people and, and there is like almost no lesson i don't feel there is a lesson except that you feel that gosh we are so fragile as Mm -hmm. the, the decency is just this thick, mm -hmm. right? And then um, under extreme second, even not so extreme circumstances, mm -hmm. it just collapse and, and and let ourselves be transformed in, in worst common kind of beasts. Mm -hmm. um, so nothing of this is really enjoyable, but everything of this is somehow emotionally charged, deeply charged, and. Um, <sighs> penetrates in the very depths of your soul somehow, lives there. Mm -hmm. What uh, What did you find that was most surprising in this particular subject? You know, what was the most surprising to me was the sheer complexity of this. I cannot, with a real exception, I cannot say these guys were good and other guys were bad. I felt that I cannot say Romanians were really most of them. Some, of course, Antonescu and this governor of the. But really, as occupying force, yeah, they were not angels, but they would not say they were real monsters in most of cases. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt the same about their charges, mm -hmm. right? People who, over whom they rule. And so I realized that I don't have any like heroes or villains in this story, almost no. Mm -hmm. I have certainly victims, mm -hmm. but other than that, it's the story full of nuances, but really having very little like lessons of, of immorality, I would say. And that is something that when you re read the story of the war, I think I would kind of, I assumed I would identify with a particular side. No, I can't. Uh, I can't identify. And that is something that is really kind of was surprising to me that uh, by the end of the day, I lost any um, partisanship that they might have had at the beginning because you look at that, these people were occupied, and those were occupiers. But can I say that occupied, although being a victim, being victims were really much better than the occupiers? I don't, I, I don't know. And were they really occupiers, all of them that bad? I really can't say that. Never. People put by the course of events over which them had no control mm -hmm. in the situation they didn't expect, didn't understand didn't fully comprehend, tried to make sense of it, usually were mistaken much of what they did and thought. Mm -hmm. And, well, yeah, sad stories, mostly of them, most of them. Was there a particular question um, that you would have really liked to get an answer for during your research, but just didn't... didn't yeah, leave? and and I think I got this answer, uh, this answer to that question. Mm -hmm. See, 
this is a big question as how much how, how big was the role that racial thinking played in determining the dynamic of German occupation policy. I didn't start the German occupation policy, right? German occupation in general. But I had this constantly in mind. The Romanians didn't have much of a um, uh, this racial arrogance mm -hmm. toward the Slavs, not like like Germans. Mm -hmm. They hated Jews, but not much. They didn't hate, really hate Slavic populations of the region. Mm -hmm. And despite the fact, they still turned them away. Mm -hmm. So it looks like the sheer greed, right, and this disregard of international norms of occupation and the feeling we need to do anything, everything we can at whatever cost to help us win this war, even if these people will suffer and will die, that was enough mm -hmm. to produce the basically very comparable effect. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this is a big question. If you think of it, it's a big question because yeah, one of the big questions, why Germans behaved during World War II in the way that they did in the East. Mm -hmm. And it looks like, to me now, more that probably the most important reason was this uh, brutalization of the war and just fear of losing it. And then, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it takes, mm -hmm. But we will win it yeah. and let them suffer. And that might have been just quite enough to cause a lot of suffering of the local population. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel it now. Of course, it's. I can claim that I, I can really make this claim for the Germans, but from the Romanian side, I feel like whether they had this feeling of racial superiority towards Slavs or not, it didn't really matter. Mm -hmm. The outcome was dictated by these considerations as I tried to explain them. Mm -hmm. So what do you hope the book will do? <laughs> well, I, don't, I never know what the book will do. You know? I, I, that is, is, uh, we never know how, how our uh, text will um, echo, right? We don't know what will be the outcome. But what I can say what I hope, I hope that people will read it and, um, oh, it's a big question. Why do historians write their books? What do they want to say by them? I really do not have any particular, you know, uh, ambition to teach something. I want to, people to know how tragic, sad, complex it was, how many mistakes, misunderstandings uh, were involved in the story. You know, maybe the only thing I want people to take it as a lesson is how stories like this humble us, how we tend to get the idea that great plans, visions, especially if they involve violence, uh, ambitions, they do not work. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we need to be more modest. And, and in this sense I meant Romanians, but also the Soviets who had their own project of this social engineering and who um, destroyed and and spoiled the life of so many uh, of their citizens. And on Romanian side, probably was was also the same, at least in this region, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have any difficulties um, finishing the book or getting it published? Not really, no. No. Um, the only difficulty was that I initially wanted to in include the story of the persecution of Jews, mm -hmm. but then while writing the book, I realized no way, because it's such a complex story, 
in and on itself. Mm -hmm. So that it deserves a special treatment. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something which I didn't expect at the beginning. It came to me, and that was the real difficult decision to make. Mm -hmm. But other than that, Cornell was my first choice, mm -hmm. and it worked perfect. Mm -hmm. Except that it's a long process, you know. Uh, it's almost three years from the time I send them and mm -hmm. it gets out. So that's, well, it's not a discipline, it's a little kind of annoying aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it worked perfect and um, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm very pleased because I really think that Carnell is now the best publishing uh, house. In our area, in this area of Slavic studies, I think the most important and most influential books are published. But so that was my first choice, mm -hmm. and it worked. And what can I say? So obviously, it was not a difficult, and I'm very pleased. Yeah, and the readers' reviews were also very positive and um, uh, constructive. Uh, in the criticism that they made. So and. The, my interaction with the editor of the series was very good, so I, I can't and can't complain. Mm -hmm. It's very perfect. So I can only wish that my next would would work this better than this one. So that's my next question. And you did mention your next writing project a little bit. Can you just briefly touch on that again? What your yeah, briefly, is? briefly. I want since I didn't include this do um, story, mm -hmm. I published essays in different venues, mm -hmm. right? On that. But I want to bring it somehow to a closure, mm -hmm. like, you know, for myself, I, I know that, I want to say that, mm -hmm. in a more systematic manner. And I decided to write a book which would tell the story of the persecution of Jews under the Romanians, mm -hmm. my version, how I understand that, because my understanding is different from the prevalent view now, which I think is inadequate. Mm -hmm right now, the most prevalent view. And um, I want to write it, and I'm writing, but there are new aspects which come and get me very excited about it. I try to know more. The last one was this legal, which I just realized kind of quite late into the process that in fact, the Romanian perpetrators violated Romanian law. Mm -hmm. And why it is why I realized it's so late, and because strange though it might be, after World War II, when they were prosecuted by the Romanian state for their crimes, they didn't invoke this criminal code, mm -hmm. which was enforced during the war. One would logically think this is how they would be uh, indicted on the basis of those uh, provisions, mm -hmm. but this was already communist Romania. <laughs> their understanding of legality was very different. So they issued their own uh, law decrees which, to which they gave retroactive force. Mm -hmm. And these people were prosecuted on the basis of this very questionable uh, legal texts. Mm -hmm. So I was unaware that there existed legal provisions in the laws in force, mm -hmm. which made it criminal at the time those acts were committed. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that it's very different from how it was in Germany, because in Western Germany, of course, the prosecution of the war crimes was conducted in a more legally correct manner, incomparably correct. So they exactly prosecuted them on the basis of the German laws enforced during World War II. Mm -hmm. something, something American audience is very little aware of. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, German historiography on this subject is very interesting, but English language is very thin. People do not understand these complexities. Yeah. So, so to me, this is an important subject. I want to understand the implications of it, because I did see some evidence that some of the perpetrators that some perpetrators or would-be perpetrators, people were, who were pressured, but they claimed to perpetrate crimes, but they claimed that they evaded this, that they were aware of that, mm -hmm. of these uh, legal provisions, that they didn't want 
to make themselves liable for prosecution. And what I became interested in, to what extent that had any consequence in real life for the victims. Of course, those who, those who were killed it didn't have. But for example, to make it more difficult for the government to actually carry out more systematic Mm. extermination. I don't think the government ever committed itself to this idea, mm. but suppose, was it one of the reasons they did never did that? Mm. Yeah. It was, there was some legal resistance, like there was some resistance by the people who could not be just legally ordered to execute civilians, they, that they knew that it was not only morally, because of course everybody knew that morally it was wrong, mm -hmm. but that it also was potentially dangerous for their own mm -hmm. uh, interests, for their own chances, mm -hmm. in case the regime would change. Because right. the Romanian um, regime in the interwar period Polit political uh, arrangements in the war period were marked by great instability. There were several regime changes. Mm -hmm. And people who were, were persecuted under one regime, at least in one case, were prosecuted under another. Mm -hmm. So that marked, you know, mm -hmm. the. Mm, the the, 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 the thinking of some of the people involved mm -hmm. in, this, in, in, the, in those campaigns of prosecution. And indeed, there is an evidence that some of them uh, try to avoid being implicated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and of course, it raises the whole host of wider issue, what is the impact of law. Right even in that anti-dictatorial regimes. And this is something that I became very important and was very interested in this subject yeah. and spend, have lately spent a lot of time on. Yeah. Um, it suggests but, that maybe the law, the law of war has more impact than just the, the law itself, but it also has maybe a social or cultural um, aspect that kind of reaches into people's behavior and thinking. Yeah, you can, there are certainly, but yeah, the law of war too, because uh, Romanians certainly violated the laws of occupation. Mm -hmm. They excuse themselves on the basis we are fighting against barbaric regime, uncivilized people. The laws which are applicable in relation between the civilized countries are not applicable mm -hmm. with respect to the uncivilized uh, nation. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's it's it's, um, um, it's purest excuse. But the interesting thing is that the Mikhail Antoniescu, sorry, uh, Ivan Antoniescu, the dictator's deputy, who's also whose last name was uh, was Antoniescu, who was distant his distant relative, was in fact a professor of international law, hmm. and he knew all of this. Hmm. And his take was his his take was he said, but what the Germans did during World War One was a violation of that law, but it didn't matter. Hmm. So why should we abide by that law? Where can people find uh, find your work on the web? Do you have a web page or um, where can people? Find oh it? no, I, I don't. But but they already have it. Oh wait, wait a second, my CV is available, of course, of our department. Oh. I don't have a special web page. Oh, okay, okay. Which university are you with? Do you University of Central Florida. Okay, all right. That's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? Thank you for your interest. I don't know how many people would be interested, yeah. um, but um, I am very impressed, and I'm very glad we had such an opportunity to talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. You can find more podcasts like this on your favorite podcast feed under the title Military History Inside Out. One great way to support me is to rate my podcasts. 
either good or bad. You can find more great military history information at warscholar.org, on YouTube at warscholar1945, on Facebook at warscholar, on Instagram at Chris Alvarez Warscholar, and on Twitter at Warscholar. Please support me by following me on those sites and liking my videos. Thank you. Thank you for watching. You can find more videos like this on YouTube at Warscholar1945. You can find the podcast version of this show on your favorite podcast feed under the title Military History Inside Out. You can find more great military history information at warscholar.org, on Facebook at Warscholar, on Instagram at Chris Alvarez Warscholar, and on Twitter at Warscholar. Please support me by following me on those sites and liking my videos. Thank you.